you know, I have to conclude tentatively that the answer is the shorts are being discouraged from being short by their investment advisors. Well, hello there, my friends. Chris Mark is here with you for Arcadia Economics and quite excited to have one of our star guests back on the show. One of the men who has one of the top understandings in the silver market, as well as a lot of areas in the other financial markets as well. I know people have really enjoyed hearing from Vince Lancy, the professor, founder of Goldfix Substack and also a partner at Echo Bay Partners and Certainly with a lot happening these days, uh, it's great to have Vince back on the show. So Vince, before we get started, a uh, pleasure to have you back on in here today. And how's everything going with you? Things things are going well. Thank you for having me back. And, and thank you for that wonderful introduction. It's very kind. Um, I also wanted to just uh, reciprocate properly. Uh, I look forward to the silver uh, event that you have. And uh, it looks like it's going to be a hoot. And I, I, I appreciate being invited to it. And uh and uh, I look forward to doing it. There well, it I'm, re I'm really excited that you're going to be joining us for Silver Fest 3 on Saturday, which is November 12th. So coming up in just a couple of days. And I think it's going to fit perfectly. You're going to be in there with Bob Coleman uh, talking primarily about the SLV shorting situation we've seen throughout the past couple months, as well as the goings on on the COMEX, where we've seen a lot of backwardation. And certainly for a lot of those technical aspects, I think that'll be great to have you and Bob there. Might add the link to sign up in the description field below. So going to be great to have you as a part of that, as well as talking about some of the things that uh, are going on now. And if people have questions, they'll be able to check in on Saturday and uh, ask some of the questions as we go along there. So looking forward to that. And Perhaps a good place to start, though, before we dig into silver, is that we'll be posting the first part of this on Tuesday when we have the midterm elections. You had a note about that in your gold fix substack column today. Mm -hmm. And obviously, it's been on the mind of people in the markets for the past couple of months. And curious what impact you think that will have, if you care to venture any guesses on how the results will play out. But in either case, uh, whichever side should be victorious. Uh, how do you see it affecting the market? I, I don't, you know, I don't have a strong, I don't have, I don't feel knowledgeable to say that I, I'm very, feel very strongly about it, but just parroting uh, people that do know more about it than me and thinking out loud for gold and silver, right? Uh, uh, it seems uh, in the investment community, the political investment community, Stiefel and what have you, uh, that the Republicans are slated to win both House and Senate, uh, pretty much definitely one and possibly the other. Um, and the implications, according to the investment banks, is that's uh, if Republicans did that, that would be bullish for old economy. I don't think this is anything that we don't know, but but uh, but the markets may have already discounted that. Uh, you can't really play that. Uh, the which is kind of and, and they said if if the Democrats win, it'll be bearish for stocks in general, not just uh, physical commodity companies. So that kind of messes me up a little bit because if if you look at I don't want like for us for for you and me and and your listeners from Precious Metals, I don't want to put too much emphasis on the election for us either way. And, and and here's why. For the last month or two, rallies in the metals, silver specifically, uh, have been short covering by CTAs and now Shanghai traders, motivated because they think the Fed may pivot, interest rate rises may back off, what have you. China may reopen their economy, who knows. Uh, but, but those reasons are classic QE type of reasons. You know, we're going to stop raising rates or we're going to lower rates or whatever we're going to do. It's going to be an increase in money supply. And so you will see silver and mostly silver, a little bit of gold, silver and um, stocks rally at the same time. But, you know, whereas it used to be stocks rally 2% and silver rally 1%. Now you're getting stocks rallying 1%, silver rallying 4%. Stocks give back that 1% and silver remains up for maybe 5%. 
that happened recently. And that's that's a microcosm of it. But the, the the reason the reason it's relevant is because the election, if the election is bearish, if if the Democrats win, and that makes the election election bearish for stocks, shouldn't metals go down too? And and I don't know. You know, I don't I don't know. I I feel that. I feel that stocks will go down and, and you will have that general, okay, stocks are going down, but that they're not going down because uh, the Fed's tightening. They're going down because of an election reason. And therefore, I don't see as many sellers returning necessarily to put their shorts on if the uh, Democrats win. And when you combine that with the seasonality of, of buying that comes in, in starting in uh, starting in really it's really about thanksgiving for good reasons uh for precious metals i i, I fail to see the election being a strong driver either way uh for metals but i, I i'd be pleasantly surprised if, if the market rallied but uh that's 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 like i tried to make something out of it but i, I can't you know it's like i can't i can't do it well i think that i just feel like they're all not no, I think that's okay. And uh, a bit of a mixed reaction. And I think there's a lot of people out there that wonder if one side or the other is really going to have that much of an impact in the way things go, and go forward. Obviously, one of the key drivers that we've seen is people reacting to the Federal Reserve. And certainly an interesting sequence of events since we had that Fed meeting last week where on the announcement... People took the impression that we may be getting the 50 basis point hike in December, metals spike up and then got clobbered for the mm -hmm. next day or so. Then Thursday or Friday of last week, a uh, rebound. And then here's Friday following China potentially reopening and the labor right. report, which, as you mentioned, was pretty mixed. We had that headline number show 261,000 jobs created, but the households report showed unemployed persons up by 306,000 and employed people down 328,000. So a bit of a mixed reaction. And was that just short covering? And were you a little bit surprised by that? Because same time we saw the similar pattern in gold and also quite a, a sell-off in the dollar index over the past couple of days as well. So what were yeah. you thinking as all of that unfolded in a pretty eventful last couple of days? Yeah. Um, uh, the, the rally in silver was way more than I thought. The bigger surprise, and I'm not going to harp on it, but the bigger surprise is gold was up 3%, over 3%. And that's extremely rare. And what I mean by that is you can see, to get it out of the way, before we go back to silver, you can see silver up 6%, 7%, 8%. You won't see gold. If you go back to 1987, I think. Uh, I've done the study in 1993, but... You rarely see gold up more than 2%. And when it has a 2% up day, statistically, it's down 5% from there two weeks from now, which only plays into the whole, uh, the price of gold is, is managed, and, which I, I believe it is. But since then, I have made numerous jokes before getting banned uh, on Twitter, temporarily, hopefully, um, saying, oh, it's up 2%. Uh, everybody go home. Uh, you know, the, the the Bank of International Settlements is saying you can't go any higher and they cap it. But they went over 3%. So I was, you know, like flabbergasted. I guess that dates me, right? It was it was amazing, right? It was a very big move. And uh, so now bringing it back to silver, that was a short covering rally. Bringing it back to silver. Uh, the Thursday rally was... If, if you remember, the market rallied in silver going into the Fed meeting, before the Fed meeting, right? You had the little spike that you, that you described selling off. And that was nervous shorts covering before the meeting. God forbid he does something where he eases, right? That little rally like the day before, like right before. Yeah, that, like that rally goes back for like, it's not a huge rally, but, you know, this massive move we just had just kind of blew the whole scale of everything out, right? So, um so what, and I, and I think I, I let readers know about that. I'm like, you know, uh, you're going to have weak hands covering. So you'll see stocks rally before Fed meeting. You'll see silver have some, uh, uh, in the current environment, rally before Fed meeting. It's because the speculators are playing the short side in both asset classes right now. 
Uh, and then whenever the news comes out, you can't tell if it's imbalanced until after the news comes out. So people kick their longs out. People kick their longs out. People got short again in silver. And then, you know, the Thursday, we start ratcheting higher. That smelled to me of a um, of a, of a, a large buy order that was using an algo. And that's just an opinion. Uh, but the Friday move really caught me off guard, right? The 6% move, 7% move. And uh, um, it caught me off guard because I wasn't as long as I wanted to be. I wasn't speculatively long, which kind of, you know, upset me a little bit. Uh, I was surprised. I thought I was getting a dip and I was going to be greedy about it. Um, what happened on Friday, and, and to your point about the, so you had the Fed come out on Wednesday and that and the Fed news wasn't really anything. So the market sold off again. And then Thursday happened, right? You had an orderly rally, but you had a strong market. Uh, and then you had Friday and the NFP comes out, the non-farm payroll number comes out. And like you said, the, the data was mixed. I think you could see it any way you want to, you know, uh, it's bad, it's good, however you want to focus on it. And if you look at the stock market on Friday, as opposed to silver, you had a stock market on Friday that was whippy. Uh, you had a big range. Uh, it went, it started it started higher before the open, went lower after the open, and then it seems like the traders came back from lunch and decided after a couple, you know, rounds of scotch or whatever it is they drink, they would, the algorithms got drunk and started buying it up again. So stocks were uh, whippy and positive one a day, but silver was strong and, you know, rock solid. So uh, after the fact, I'm like, why did silver do this, you know, and, 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 to your point about China, I'm like, okay, silver's rhyme because of China. Let me see if that's true. Is copper up? You have to look at, is copper up? Yes, that's true. Are the PGMs up? Yes, that helps it. Okay, is gold up? Well, shit, yeah, it's up way too much. You know, gold is not the most important piece of that, um, but it was up way too much. And I said, okay, so, you know, what's going on? And while I don't understand what's going on, I did underestimate the, the, uh, the effect, uh, after checking with some people, of uh, the Shanghai, the Chinese traders now. Uh, and I underestimated them because in the past, I used to see them coming and could trade around them because it was one day, you know, uh, and it was one day, a 2% move. But, you know, if you hear the, uh, for example, uh, you hear China's going to low, in, in the past, you hear China's going to low rates, you hear China's going to make it easier to invest. You see the base metals, iron will rally the day one. Day two, copper and aluminum. And then day three, silver and then gold. And then when gold rallies, you'd hear them say, capital controls, you're speculating too much. You know, a day, a week, a month later. And then all the stuff just washes out. But six, 7% in silver, I was like, wow, that's way more than I thought uh, the effect that they would have. And the answer, you know, I have to conclude tentatively that the answer is the shorts are being discouraged from being short by their investment advisors, which is why um, I believe that if you have the CTAs in the US covering, right? And now you have Shanghai traders who had been uh, selling it uh, because of the worsened or even worser situation in China with their own potential recession or whatever it is that it's a recession. Uh, uh, you probably have them more heavily short than usual. When you combine these, two normally small to medium-sized shorts in the market with the absolute lack of real investment hedging, right? Uh, with a with lack of real investment long speculation, you're getting bigger moves now. It's almost like, it's almost like, and, and physical people would love to hear this, but the futures market is breaking and it's not gonna happen overnight, but it is happening slowly. Now I'm not saying it can't get good again, but I'm saying the moves are getting more exaggerated. And that's a sign of a market that is that is breaking. Anyway, long story short, uh, I will not underestimate the potential for China uh, uh, moving the market uh, large going into this buy season, which I'm very excited about. Uh, uh, I'm always excited about the, the seasonality involved in precious metals, but rarely am I excited about silver, uh, which we can talk about if you want. Yeah, and and one of the questions I had following up on that, which perhaps is where you were going with this, uh, you can let me know. 
Are these guys concerned at all when they see the declining inventories? We had the latest LBMA numbers out. Uh, I believe that came out this morning. And another month down from 871 to 852,000 uh, million ounces, rather. Same time, we continue to see the stockpile on the COMEX now under 35 million ounces. Is that something that enters into their mind? Are they concerned about that at all? Or, or how do you think they're looking at that, some of these funds? Well, when you mean they, you mean you mean the, uh, the, the the fund speculators? Yeah, the ones that have been going short for these past couple oh, okay. of Okay, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, that's a good question. I think that's, that's something in the back of their mind that freaks them out. So uh, most of these CTAs, and I can't speak for the Shanghai guys, but the CTAs are trend-following algorithms. So they get an algorithm. The algorithm says if it goes to here, it'll go to there. And they sell. And they sell weakness and they buy strength. And they're machine-like. They used to be people advising them, but now they're machine-like uh, CTA algorithms. And so they don't uh, look at, uh, generally speaking, they don't look at the uh, uh, the silver, uh, dwindling silver supply as part of their matrix. However, you know, you start seeing this in the news and it hasn't even hit the news in our little world, in our little biopic world, it's there every day, you know, but the public doesn't know about it at all. It's ridiculous, you know, um, and, and and anyway, so uh, do you, so the question that you're asking is, do I think that those influence it? Um, uh, I want to say, I know that they do not influence it going in, going out. I know that coming out of these trades, they don't cover because the algorithm says uh, cover. Like they get in because it's down and it'll go down more. It's up, it'll go up more. When they get out, it's it's not, uh, it's a financial stop. It's not a momentum stop. And so, so they get in on momentum and they get out on VAR. So what that means is, uh, uh, without this being like too boring about it, it's like, okay, I get in because the model says it's going down. And then a week later, it's like, I get out because the Fed's going to be speaking and I'm shitting myself, you know? So the exits are not mathematical. They're not statistical. The, the, the exits are because of fear. So going in, to answer your question, going in, they're not looking at uh, warehouses. Coming out, they're going to start looking at warehouses more and more. And it's getting easier to, uh, this is a little bit of hope on my part. It's getting easier to push them. You know how the longs used to get pushed in silver very easily. Well, uh, it's getting easier for bullion banks to make money by running in the silver shorts. Uh, and and, and I, I firmly believe that that's what's going to happen uh, this year. Uh, although, you know, I haven't put a position onto that effect yet. Uh, so, so, um, the answer about the uh, about the inventories, I do want to, if, if it's okay with you, I want to comment about the inventories uh, uh, please, please. from in an even handed way. You know, um, not the thing we talked about before. I'm not going to do that. Um, uh, that was that joke. But, you know, there's like three in my mind. That's like I have I'm like playing three way tennis with the inventories all the time. One is, oh, my God, this is crazy. Right. Second one is ah, the market would be higher if they were paying attention to it. It doesn't matter. Right. And then the third one is and this is the new one. Oil SPR. So we'll come to that one last. But. The first one is this is crazy, and it's crazy not just because of the of the amount that's coming out. It's crazy because of the orderliness of it coming out. Okay, which which you know I'm trying to keep balance here, which to me says it's it's methodical and it's real, not fake. Conversely, it also says I'm on a balance. I'm bullish because of it, but I'm I have to look at both sides of every story, right? It also says to me, I've seen this before, and it isn't necessarily bullish. It's just moving metal from one spot to another. So in the past, in the past, moving metal from one spot to the other, this is now we're into part two. Like, ah, it's not a big deal. Moving metal from one spot to the other has been a feature of arbitrage. You know, uh, it's more expensive here, so it goes from one vault to the other. Well, it's not going from COMEX to LME. It's not going from LBMA. It's not going from London to New York. It's not going, it's going from London to somewhere. It's going from New York to somewhere. And as you pointed out last week or last couple of weeks, 
we talked, you know, uh, India has been a big buyer, right? Uh, outsized when you think about it compared to their, their previous buying. We all know about the gold purchases. So, you know, if you're not going to buy gold, you're going to buy silver. So if, if silver is the poor man's gold, then, uh, then silver is also the poor G7's uh, gold, you know? Uh, anyway, um, so, so the first thing is, wow, this is really going low. This is crazy, right? And you want to just FOMO it. The second thing is, eh, it's huge, but I've seen it before. And we've also had the metal at these levels in the past. Maybe this is migration from one part of the world to the other. Well, the math says it's not. The math says that if it is migrating from one part of the world to the other, it's migrating to Asia. And we just don't know it yet. So there's an arbitrage, you know, the EFP's over, sell the physical, buy the futures, take delivery, close it out, you know. Uh, and the third thing is, so, you know, I'm balanced. And the third thing is that makes me realize that markets aren't always efficient, right? So the first thing is excitement. The second thing is markets are efficient. Shut up, silver would be higher if it mattered, right? And the third thing is markets aren't always efficient anymore. They're not continuously efficient. And my reason for that is, is, um, uh, I, I co-write with Bryn Kelly. She's an excellent oil analyst. And we've known each other for years. And she's an expert on the SPR and, and, and how that how that manifests in the markets. And we have been looking at the markets, the oil markets, saying, why is everyone talking about the SPR going down? That's not what matters. And the SPR is going down. What matters is X. Why is everyone talking about the SPR? Oil's not rallying. This is like two months ago. The SPR is, you know, it's a drawdown in the SPR, like it's a drawdown in the metals vaults. It's the same idea, right? For different reasons, but it's the same idea. So it's going down. Why is oil not rallying? And, you know, my two cents in when I speak with her is, well, that's because of rehypothecation. They're tamping the price down. They're keeping a lid on it. Elections coming up, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but this week or late last week, um, and this is this ties in directly with silver behaviorally. Uh, but the oil market's not efficient because there's someone in the room keeping a lid on it when they can, right? And then this whole China thing happens. They might reopen, they might not reopen. Uh, the Fed might not raise 75 basis points. Uh, uh, the Republicans might win. And oil, the day that silver rallied, had like a 3 4% move. And I go, oh, the SPR doesn't matter until it matters. That's why I said to myself, I go, the SPR doesn't matter because the day after that, everyone's talking about the SPR. And I'm like, oh, so now you've got the SPR story that doesn't matter. And you have a rally and now all of a sudden in, a, in, a, in an ass backwards way, it's like, oh, the SPR narrative makes sense. You know? So, so, so when you apply that to silver, Right, oil takes five days, two months to be efficient. Silver takes five years. You know, so if you, so I made that observation about oil, and I said, why can't that be true in silver? Maybe the metal coming out of oil does matter. And I went, oh, wow, and I just, and I went, oh, silver really is inefficient. Silver really is broken at the futures level. Silver really is hated. I don't, I can't. I see a lot of research reports. I see nothing in silver. I see more on copper than I do in silver. Yet silver is the bigger market in the U.S. Anyway, so so I am now firmly, although I'm not positioned for it yet, on the side that the that the vaults matter. There's one other caveat which is not bearish. In the past, I want to just like if you could just like if this isn't real, meaning we all know it's real. It's real. It's happening. If the metal coming out of the vault isn't real and it's going to work its way back in, in the past, when the metal has come out of the vault and gone back in, the market has rallied as the metal has come back in. It's insane. So on the day that silver rallied 7%, I think we had like 1.3 million ounces go back in the vault. I went, so this is not from, so even if I'm wrong and it's not from the vault coming out, the news is going to get out. And so Everything about me says this market is higher, except one thing, uh, uh, which is which I'll be cut and dry about, and that is tactically we're at the top of a range. I'm not a technician, but I've noticed that for the last. Uh, if you have a daily silver chart, it'll be really good. It'll be really good to uh, explain that. But if they pull up a daily silver chart, you'll see it's like it's like a it's like a 
We made it, we broke this little structure area and then we went down a lot, up a lot, down. A, it's like a W, right? And uh, yeah, if you pull that up, see that line where it says 2091, that line right there? That's a perfect line. It's already in a dotted line. It's already there. That's perfect. When we broke below, this is a technical comment, but it corroborates what I'm seeing in the market. When the market broke in early July, below 2090, and just never saw the light of day for a week, that little structure, that little hump, when that little hump is broken and the market drops, that's when I identified the Goldfish people. I said, that CTA is selling because the recession is coming. They're thinking recession, right? And then and I said, watch this. We're going to have serial short covering rallies. I don't know where they'll go to. And then after that first sell-off, you had that little V-shaped bottom almost there. And the market was up to 2091, right? And then it gets overbought. And by the way, at the bottom, it happens again. The EFP goes negative again. The physical guys take over. And then it goes up again. So you have this, after that July sell-off, you got a rally, sell-off, another rally that comes short of 2090, another sell-off, and now you're at 2090 again. So a technician would say you should buy it above this or sell it below that. And I'm saying to you as a trader who definitely, you know, I know when I'm wrong, I know when I'm right, who definitely got it right that the CTAs in July I identified that the CTAs are going to be selling weakness and buying strength. And they're going to be doing it a lot. And they did it a lot. This move that we just had, like, oh my goodness, 7%. It's the Shanghai guys. I forgot about them. So now you got CTAs and Shanghai and dueling front and dueling short covering. I go, all right, so now we can really run it. Then I looked at this chart again and I said, oh, if I believe that the CTAs are doing short covering rallies, as I do, and the Shanghai guys are now involved, I also believe that someone is keeping a lid on it. And I don't mean this in a paranoid way that there's real selling at 2090, 20, 2100 to keep it below that for whatever reason. It could be producer. Who the hell knows? We don't know. I'm just saying that in the short term, if we come off, I would rather buy it at 2105 than I would at 2080. Does that make sense? Yeah. You know, That's your indication so, so, whether we're going to just bounce back under that level again versus if we go through it perhaps changing the market structure that we're looking right. at. Right. I mean, exactly, exactly. So, so, so like a technician would say exactly what I just said, but for technical reasons, and I'm saying to you that technical analysis is based on flows and fundamentals. We all know what the fundamentals are. There's not enough silver out there. The flows are CTA sell it, it goes down. CTA is buy it, it goes up. See, what stops from going up? Two things stop it from going up. And that will change after Thanksgiving. The first thing is someone sells it at 2090. Someone, it's not mysterious. Someone sells it. They're selling there. Who it is? I don't care. It just stops. The second thing is at this time of year, the funds that sell it, CTAs and funds, I'll use those terms interchangeably, that sell it and cover, at this time of year, they lick their wounds after they cover. They don't start to get long. When allocations to metals come after Thanksgiving, they sell it, it goes down, they cover, and then they flip and they get long. And so we're not seeing anyone buy it and flip and get long. My point is, if this were to happen uh, after Thanksgiving, I might be a buyer of dips. Right now, I want to I want to see it prove to me that there's there's buying. There's no residual buying after the shorts cover right now. To put it in in five words, there's no residual speculative buying when the shorts cover right now. Uh, there will be after Thanksgiving. And how much remains to be seen, but I think that it will it will be a good season this year. So that's you, it. I hope you that also helps. mentioned that some of the moves are being exacerbated because with the Fed withdrawing liquidity and also some funds closing up shop, winding down positions for the end of the year, that we could expect some of the moves just in general to be more exacerbated. Yeah, yeah, um, uh, yeah. That's that's actually people people, especially in precious metals. Um, uh, we forget it because we've been beaten down for so long. But people people forget that when 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 liquidity is pulled out of the market, generally speaking, it means that anybody who invests or allocates money on the long side, basically hedge funds are long something or you know forgetting the short side, right? When that happens, you have you have uh, you know let's say I have two investments. I have I have Apple and I have gold, 
Right, right. And uh, and my interest rates go from 1% to 5%. Well, now I'm borrowing at a higher interest rate and I look at the two assets and I go, which one's not performing well for me? And I close my gold out, but I keep my apple, which might not be a good idea now, but that's what they would do historically. So, so the liquidity drives the lack of liquidity, the Fed taking the punch bowl away, as they used to say, will drive gold down. It'll drive, it'll drive Apple down too, but not as much. But what metals people forget because we've been so beat is that liquidity works both ways. It's not because money is being taken away. It's because funds close positions because their cost of capital goes up. So if most funds are short, then they're going to close short positions, which is why you will see um, exaggerated moves in both directions. Uh, uh, and it's why you like to see a lot of funds short going into uh, post Thanksgiving. The, the second reason you alluded to was um, funds, uh, companies closing shop. Yes, uh, historically, uh, a lot of your bigger hedge funds and your prop desks will wind down their position from September, October, November, because they close their fiscal year in November. People get their bonuses. And they also like to close down because when the allocations come in from the regular investment community, they want to be fresh. They want to start out. So the, the, the month of October is liquidation month. Traditionally, that means gold goes down and silver goes down. But Sometimes, as you've seen in, violent, like in, in, in years gone by, you will see massive rallies from, uh, from uh, funds closing down in silver. And we're seeing that uh, again today. So the exaggeration is, is uh, the fact that we're in a thinner market. Uh, the Fed's in a tightening cycle, uh, can work both ways. And, and the, uh, uh, the fact that people are closing their books. So those are two big contributing factors that you, that you described. Yeah. Well, certainly should set up for an interesting next couple of months of the year. And especially you mentioned earlier the efficient market hypothesis, which I think about sometimes where, you know, the idea that everyone that, that we were, uh, that I learned at Wharton and that we were told in college that everyone's getting the same information, pricing it in the exact same way at the same time, uh, yeah. generally not exactly how these things play out. And that is part one of this month's call with Vince Lancey. Good to dig into the silver market. Although plenty more coming tomorrow when we have part two of that, where we dig into gold and a few other topics in terms of how all these things play out. So thanks to Vince for everything he shared there. Always fun catching up with him. I think you'll enjoy part two as well. Real quick before we wrap up, though, would like to thank Silver Viper for bringing us today's episode of the show. And Silver Viper actually had some exciting news out yesterday early as they entered into a letter of intent to acquire Canisil Resources. This is an all stock transaction, which would be an exchange of every four shares of Canisil Resources that someone owns. You would get one share of Silver Viper, who is excited to take over their silver, gold, copper, zinc, and lead projects in Durango and Zacatecas in Mexico, as well as British Columbia. Let's give Silver Viper a variety of options, including exploring the assets, optioning assets, creating a maiden resource, or spinning out some new projects. I actually did just catch up with Steve Cope of Silver Viper, who described the details of the deal. So we'll link to that video at the end of this one. The deal as proposed would be scheduled for a February closing. It does give Silver Viper a termination fee if there is another bidder for any reason. Canisil walks away from the deal. That's a $500,000 termination fee. So again, I know Steve was looking forward to picking up those assets. So nice transaction for Silver Viper, who will also be at Silverfest this coming weekend on Saturday, November 12th. So certainly if you have questions about the deal or anything else that Silver Viper is doing, can interact with them directly on Saturday. Link to sign up for Silverfest 3, which is free and online in the description field below. I'm again, uh, quite honored and my pleasure to have Silver Viper joining us there. They'll be doing a presentation and having a booth where you can interact with management. So with that said, we're gonna wrap up for today. We'll have part two with Vince Lancey tomorrow. Though to find out more about the deal directly from Steve Cope of Silver Viper, well, that video is coming your way now.